Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here. Uh, my name is Aldo Pisano. I come from uh, Italy, and I am a PhD student in learning sciences and digital technologies. And I'm also a high school teacher, so these two things in my life are really important because my research is really uh, close to the practical way I live, uh, you know, uh, my work and my use and my approach to AI. Uh, so I must start with an apology with you because uh, this, this, this won't be a technical speech. This, is, this will be about uh, ethics, education and AI and because they are my research interests and, uh, uh, and, I, come and I work for University of uh, Calabria. Uh, so, what are we trying to do with this, uh, uh, with this uh, practice that we're, that we're building is uh, find a way to build a framework about not only an AI literacy in schools, but also about the AI and AI and ethics literacy, which means that we could find, uh, we should find a critical approach to the use of the, uh, to the, use of the AI while we are, uh, while our uh, you know, while our uh, future, uh, the, the future citizens, future social actors, future workers are still in the process of education. So if we start from the very beginning, it's really important for us to educate uh, in fostering awareness about the critical use of the AI. Now, uh, allow me to guide you through this narration. What I want to do today is to tell you a story about this research project. So we'll start from some methodological premises and then we'll try to focus on the AI and ethics literacy model and then we go to, uh, we try to understand if we can uh, find a model about uh, a sustainable approach to, a sustainable approach to the AI. <clears throat> about the methodological premise, I have to say that, uh, as, I, as, I, as, I t as I've said before, uh, we'll uh, work with the ethical and the educational approach that are really important uh, and we'll see why uh, and we'll see uh, how it is important because uh, we, we, we should assume that education shapes the world and the world that we're going to live with the AI and that our, the future citizens, our new generations are going to live with the AI. So on the other hand, we try to uh, find out some uh, guidelines in order to approach to the ethical use of the AI. In this sense, we will use a risk-based approach, a responsibility-based approach that's really important to me, and then the human-centered approach. These will, they will help us in coordinating uh, and uh, they will guide us through this uh, ethical use of AI and in building this framework. So, before we start, uh, and uh, as I've said, this will be very philosophical, uh, I hope not. And I, f I hope to find you all awake at the end of my speech. <laughs> and uh, uh, from a very, you know, uh, looking at this risk map, uh, we have a very philosophical uh, main risk that is the prevailing of a mathematical model. Or, now, if the mathematical model prevails, prevails in education, we run the risk of weakening critical thinking. If it uh, uh, prevails in politics, we run the risk of over-trusting AI systems and absolving ourselves in, of the decision-making processes. And in society, we run a risk of thinking that we can rely only on rigorous demonstrations and not not more on dialectics. Well, this means that uh, we can, uh, we, 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 we could risk uh, to, uh, to weaken uh, the idea of uh, dialectics, uh, dialectics as free debate skill and as free uh, uh, argumentation skill in order to uh, find a different solution in a way that, he, that, that starts from a forum, a way through which we can talk together in a democratic way, in an inclusive way, uh, finding different principles and different rules to answer to different challenges in different scenarios. So that's the point of a, a democratic approach to uh, what we call truth. And the problem about truth is a very ethical problem when we talk about the AI, and now we'll, we'll see why. Now, uh, you know, I think that AI is really useful in many ways, 
in education too, because uh, uh, big, big data association between big, uh, among big data or uh, risk prevention or uh, pattern creation. But even in education, it is really important because it can help us in personalizing learning. And at the same time, it can help us in feedback regulation with our students. It can give a very quick feedback to the, our students. But the problem is, when we talk about ethics, and when we talk about AI, something strange is happening. Because uh, there is a very trivial idea of ethics today. When I usually ask, what do you think about ethics? What do you think ethics is? Usually people answer me, you know, uh, ethics is something that is that thing that tells you what you must do and what you must not do. As I've said, this is a very trivial idea of ethics. Ethics, ethics has its own development for centuries as uh, technology, as society, uh, and so, as social processes. And today we talk about applied ethics. Applied ethics means that we, uh, uh, we have to know the new scenarios and we have to acquire knowledge about new situation in our social life, about the new technological uh, developments in order to build new principles to regulate these new tools, especially about the AI. So the responsibility ethics help us. It's not just forbidding us something. It's helping us in guiding and coordinating the use of the AI. That's the point. It's really trivial. It's really simple. But it can be useful if we apply it in an educational framework. And in this sense, it can help us in developing new skills in our, in, in our new in, in the new generations. So where they are going to live in the new world, where they, are, where they are going to share their life with AI systems, where they're going to live with AI systems, they know how to critically approach them, even if they are in a, a social space or in a workspace. So, in Europe, we have two uh, important documents about the AI regulation. One of these has just has recently been approved last Friday, I think, and it is the AI Act. It is a very strong legislative model. And on the other hand, the starting point of the AI Act is the, uh, where the European guidelines for trustworthy AI. Now, about the AI Act, as you can see here, it is it it, it, it you know it say it says us. What, what are the main risks that can come uh, from hey high use? So the first uh, point is the unacceptable risks, risk, which means manipulation, social scoring, and all these practices that should be forbidden by the AI Act and in Europe. Now, the point about the, the AI Act, it has, it, it has been discussed a lot because you cannot deny possibility to companies uh, or industries to develop new systems and at the same time uh, you, but at the same time you should regulate uh, the use of the AI to prevent uh, and uh, to, to, to preserve uh, democracy to preserve pluralism now how can we adopt a system that can help us in regulating the AI. So the point was uh, about the uh, trustworthy, the, the, guy, the um, European guidelines for the trustworthy AIs, AI. This was the starting point of the AI Act. And it provides us, as you can see, a system of principles that every company or every industry can use uh, case by case, you know? If I am a, if I am an industry and I'm not involved in the uh, to in uh, in uh, if, if I'm not damaging the um, uh, environment, then in this case I can choose that my first principle, my priority, will not be sustainability, but it could be accountability. So uh, the trustworthy uh, trustworthy AI. Uh, can, provides us a flexible model of principles that can be used and can be adapted situation by situation. And it is a model of ethics that, 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 uh, that can work in order to um, you know, respect uh, the freedom of technological development. So all these points now are under discussion in Europe because we have this you know, fight, also a fight between industries and Europe. But uh, what we really 
uh, need to uh, do, what we really need to understand is that if we don't know the problem, we cannot uh, fight and we cannot face the challenges. So uh, let's make an example. Between the end of the 18th century and nowadays, we have witnessed, uh, uh, you know, um, um, an increasing development of uh, use of cars, uh, vehicles, and what have we done? Have we denied the possibility for everyone to own, its, uh, to own her or uh, his car? Obviously not. What we have done was to reshape the world, was to redesign the world, building streets, building interstates, and at the same time, we build new rules. That's what a model of ethics can help us, building new rules for new scenarios that are coming up. And about this, uh, in education, when we talk uh, uh, when, with the project that we're working on in the southern Italy with these schools, is to build a model of responsibility by design, which means that from the very beginning, from they were, when they are pupils, when they are students, I can work with them in order to build and to foster their awareness about the ethical use of AI and in the world where they are going to live and where they are going to uh, share social spaces and workspaces, as I've said before, with the AI. So uh, ethics uh, and education are helping us because while, while law is slow, it takes time, you know, uh, because, you know, technology is growing and it's developing in a very fast way. Uh, education is now. Ethics is now. As a teacher, I can tell to my student, I'm just giving an example, I can tell to my, I can tell to my student, okay, are you, uh, are you controlling your smartphone or are you controlled by your smartphone? Okay. This is a very simple question, a very simple strategy. And we need to to work on these little strategies in order to build this awareness about the use of the AI. Uh, because if we look at the problem from the perspective of the company, from the industry, we are just working in a technical way. But if we look from the perspective of the educational field, there, there we have some problems. Because, you know, if you, if you go into a school or if you go into a university, maybe, uh, they don't know that on, set, on the settings of their smartphone there's a, there's a system to check the screen time. Maybe they don't know. It's just a problem about information. It's a very simple problem and we can resolve it through this model of responsibility, of a responsibility by design. This, this, is the, you know, this is the feedback loop that help us and that can tell us that education can shape the world. And it is not new. So I need you to jump back of to to, uh, 2,500 years. Sorry for this. <laughs> uh, here we are in the 500 before Christ. And the Paideia model is uh, an educational model. Paideia is a word which approximately means, in, Gre in Greek, is a Greek word which approximately means education. We can translate it with education. The Paideia model is a model that still works because it's very simple. It works like this. We have the educator. The educator helps the students to grow up as an autonomous individual. And at the same time, it helps him to grow up as a future citizen. But those students that will be citizens, they will be educators as parents, as workers, as, uh, as uh, teachers maybe. And so here we go again with the feedback loop of Paideia. This, this is a model that still works. But the question is, has it changed for centuries? Obviously, yes, because for, uh, between, for centuries we had the mediation of technology. Technology put itself between the social actors of Paideia. And today the problem is not about this, because we always had tool of mediation. From book, now we have e-book. From uh, blackboard, now we have digital board. That's not the problem. The problem about the AI is that it is not between the social actors of the Paideia circle. It is among us. It is through us. So it is not 
only in the classroom. It is outside the classroom. It is in, our, in, the, in the social life of our students. It is in their familiar life. Think about the IoT systems. And so they need to know that they should live with the AI using uh, an approach that it's not denying the possibility of to be supported by AI decision making as a decision making tool, but how to coordinate their new action, their actions as future citizens and as future workers in, uh, in a system and in a world where they will live with the AI. Because we are in a very, in a moment of an anthropological twist. This anthropological twist is what the philosopher Luciano Floridi uh, would uh, uh, call the on-life era. The on-life era is uh, an era where we share our identity as a physical identity and as a virtual identity, both supported by AI systems. So we need to know that we live in this new era and we live in a wider space and that we need new form of citizenship. And that, here we go, to the uh, AI and ethics literacy uh, framework. As you can see here, uh, it is not only about uh, students, it is about teachers too. We, we cannot think that we can only educate students. We should educate teachers, and those teachers will educate other students in this ethical approach to the AI. But today we will focus just uh, uh, on the students. And when this question and when this problem about uh, uh, if we need and why we need an AI, uh, if we need an AI and ethics literacy came up to my mind, it was 2019, uh, it split into three other questions. The first question was why an AI and ethics literacy, how an AI and ethics literacy, and where an AI and ethics literacy. About the why, it's what we have talked until now, and uh, just this is a little the briefing for you. Why it's just to promote a critical use of the AI in order to prevent manipulation, prevent discrimination, protect autonomy, responsibility, and support social society and politics. About the how, this is a very core, a very core uh, topic. Uh, because here, we need to understand that we cannot only educate towards the AI or with the AI as a tool, but we need to educate the AI itself. I'm thinking about, about those uh, students uh, who will be uh, programmers who will be mathematicians, who will be engineers in industries, and they will train algorithms. So in, those, in, in that sense, they need to know now that the algorithms that are more pervasive and AI generally will be more autonomous, more adaptive, it needs to be educated to answer to different scenarios in the specific way that the scenario requires. I'm, I, I'll, I'll, I'll let you understand in a few minutes, because this is what we are doing in schools. This is very simple. These are some best practices. We are working eight hours with uh, different classes and different students, and we are working on, on these main topics. First of all, the automation bias. Our students need to know that AI does not own the truth. In order to do this, we are developing beside this awareness that, that can be, you know, um, uh, a, more, a more technical uh, education like data awareness or computation or coding, we need to promote another approach that is the uh, one for which we are educating to, to critical thinking, which means I can be supported by AI system. AI system can support me if I am chatting with ChatGPT. But what I need to do is to uh, question ChatGPT and try to find divergent and different solutions from the ones that ChatGPT is giving to me. This is a way to develop critical thinking. So is it saying, is it telling me the truth? Is it a fake news or is it, uh, is it, is, is it a, 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 a data that I can collect and that I can keep for myself? So this is the point. 
And through this, we can develop uh, argumentation. Uh, we are developing argumentation and debate skills with our students, not only a debate between two students or among a group of students, but even between a group of students and the AI itself. We ask some question to ChatGPT, and we we uh, we can try we, we try to understand if he's telling us if he's giving us the best solution for a specific problem that we're trying to solve. And to find the best solution, this is the problem about the truth of the AI, is that is we we also need to develop another topic, another skill that is the frame analysis skill. Is that answer? Can that principle, can that value can be applied to that specific situation? So that's the point about the use of the AI and about the education of the AI itself. Then we are working on dopamine fasting strategies too, like, uh, the, as I've said before, uh, checking uh, the screen time. Uh, and uh, um, beside this, in order to develop the critical thinking, we're working on some fact-checking rules which means that uh, when I'm looking for uh, data and I'm looking for news, uh, uh, or I'm just uh, uh, searching something on, uh, on a website or looking for something on my social space, I need to know if that new is correct, is true or is not true. It is, uh, it, we have a really simple strategy that is the lateral reading of the news. Lateral reading means that I can, it's very trivial for us. I get out of that website and I ask to another browser, for example, or to, uh, I open another page and then I ask that page, is that website uh, a fake website or is, it, is, it, is that news a, uh, a fake news or is it true? These are really simple strategies, and uh, that's what we need to work on f uh, when we are educating uh, to the critical use of the, use of the AI, because for us, as I've said many times today, are very trivial things, but not for new generations. And the new generations will be the future workers, will be our future politicians, will be our future, uh, the social, future social actors in our world. <clears throat> We're I'm at the end, almost at the end. Um, we are doing this, doing this work in 12 classes in the southern Italy, and we are doing it during, during the hour of uh, civics, uh, which means adopting an interdisciplinary approach. And we are working on some questionnaire that can help us in collecting data at the end of these, uh, uh, of these uh, uh, experiment of this, oh, sorry, it's not experiment, <laughs> it's just uh, um, um, of this research project, we can collect data and try to understand if this, this model can be wider and it can be developed in all over Italy and maybe for other people who want to share it. Then <clears throat> uh, what we are doing very simply is that is we, we're working not only on knowledge but also on competences to build this social sustainable circle of the use of the AI. To do, to do this, uh, we uh, are thinking about uh, this large ethical model. So we start from the individual, we work on the citizen, and we work on our future workers too. So we are rethinking that Paideia circle in order to uh, help our students as future workers in future companies to be aware about uh, the danger, how, how, how AI can be dangerous, uh, especially in the use of, uh, that, we, that we have with uh, uh, training algorithms with data sets that could be incomplete, for example, and they could, uh, could not represent some group of people. So, in this sense, and I am uh, almost at the end, uh, we are developing another idea that is not about schools, but it is about industries and companies. This model is the ECAI model, uh, ethical counseling for AI. Uh, this is between uh, the programming phase of the AI in the, uh, in the company and the application phase of the AI in the, in the company or in the industry. 
And uh, this, is, this can be very useful because it helps in preventing irreversible risks, irreversible ethical risks, risks like discrimination. Uh, because if I work um, in my company, if I have a sociologist or an ethicist and I build an interdisciplinary team, uh, they can help me in understanding which data I can use to build a data set and that data set could help an algorithm to be trained in order to avoid discrimination. And on the other hand, it is useful to save autonomy. Which autonomy? What autonomy? The autonomy of the employers. Because in a, mo in a, in a world and in a workspace where AI is more autonomous and is more adaptive, we need to uh, increase the awareness about, uh, of the um, employers themselves. Uh, looking at the human-computer interaction model, for example, uh, I know that if the AI is really autonomous and uh, it can interrupt my task, I need to know where I can cooperate with the AI until it does not interrupt my task while I'm working as an employer and when I have to take a decision and when the AI has to take a decision. So that's the point about saving autonomy. Uh, with this model, so we are trying to bring uh, industries and companies from a level of ignorance to a level of knowledge about the ethical governance of the use of the AI. And we have two different models. The first one is a soft model. It's a model of networking. Uh, it's very cheap for an industry or for a company because it's just to inform about the ethical use of the AI. Uh, I can just uh, adopt some principles uh, and some rules for uh, the governance, the AI governance of my um, on my company, I can uh, upload them on my website and then I create a network. So those uh, companies and those industries who do, uh, which don't know anything about this can uh, share this knowledge and so maybe they can adopt other uh, form of principles to regulate their own system of AI. And in the end, uh, we have another model that is even the ethical counseling for AI model, but it is, a, it is a hard model for industries, which means that it is more expensive for them uh, because we, it is uh, education-based. We provide training programs for our employers about the ethical use of AI, or we can engage, we can hire people from other organizations, other fields like ethicists, sociologists, and uh, uh, anthropologists that can tell us uh, how to work ethically on my AI system. And so I, in this way, I can build an interdisciplinary team that is really important nowadays for the ethical regulation of the AI. Uh, in the end, what I want to say is that everything we are doing is a, is a bottom-up process. We're working with education, we're working with students, we can work with, our, with employers if we are an industry or a company, but we also need other tools that are in top-down intervention tools like politics, and especially in this sense, politics, needs, need, politics can help us preserving pluralism, complexity, and truth. Where truth means, uh, and I want to, uh, and with this quote by Hannah Arendt, uh, from a political perspective, truth has a despotic character, which means that if we can rely too much on the AI and we think that AI owns the truth and we don't adopt a critical approach to the AI system in order to understand the uh, specific frames where I am, I am applying the AI uh, systems, uh, it could be a problem for inclusion. And uh, uh, to build inclusive scenarios, I need not to take one truth and say, okay, this is the truth and it is the same for all the situations. This is not the point. And this is what AI could do. What I need to do is, with that critical approach we are, uh, we are talking about, to be intelligent about th the frame where I'm working on. And intelligence is adaptation to the specific situation, even if we are using an AI, systems, an AI system. And that's why intelligence is really something different from computation. 
thank you very much for your attention. And if you need any, if you have any questions or if you need something, if you want to share ideas or join the project, these are my, co my contacts. And I thank you very much for your attention. Oh, this is a very uh, strong question. Uh, I'm happy from an ethical perspective, but from uh, you know, uh, if I look at it from the um, perspective of a technological development about industries, I can think that some strong legislative model can compromise uh, technological development. Uh, but from a, a, an ethical perspective, I'm happy, especially when we talk about uh, the social scoring tools uh, that, uh, and uh, manipulation tools. Uh, so that, that's the point where I'm uh, really ethically happy. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>